And we're live. Go ahead, George. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, comrades from the Workers' Party joining this meeting via Zoom and the friends uh, who are watching on YouTube. And as I like to say, I hope there are fewer friends next week and more comrades. This uh, meeting is entitled Socialism and War. And that will, of course, be the subject I shall address. Uh, but I hope, Dan, that you'll permit me just a couple of words uh, about a kind of war uh, that's going on in the Labour Party. I don't want to dwell on the uh, grisly, grotesque, actually, quite obscene detail uh, in the leaked uh, documents that have been published. Uh, I just wanted to make this point because we are in danger on social media at least of imagining that this story which indeed is a gigantic story in the annals of the history of the labor movement gigantic uh, it is in danger of being reduced to a barrel quite a big barrel of rotting apples uh, in the headquarters of the labor party in london and uh, as if it were they alone uh, who cost the country a Jeremy Corbyn Labour government in 2017. Uh, but of course, that's nonsense. Uh, no small uh, group or even medium sized group of staff members in a headquarters uh, can be entirely responsible for a crime of that magnitude. The truth is, this is systemic and has been the reality uh, throughout more or less the whole history uh, of the uh, British Labour Party. Nye Bevan in the 1950s uh, pointed out, uh, and I think I can quote it almost uh, by heart, that the right wing of the Labour Party would sooner destroy the Labour Party than to allow the left and the conference decisions made by the left to uh, come to pass. Uh, if I paraphrase that, uh, it is accurately. Uh, the reality is Jeremy Corbyn in part behaved in the way that he did towards the right of the Labour Party in the belief uh, that if he did not, the right wing of the Labour Party would depart en masse uh, from the party, splitting it, and I uh, presume he would imagine that would be electorally damaging. Uh, but the truth is, they had no need to depart. Only the, the, the most uh, ludicrous sections uh, actually did depart, and a lot of good that it did them. They had a better plan, uh, which is the plan that had worked uh, for the greater part of a century, namely of ruthlessly, completely immorally, and on an entirely false prospectus, undermining the uh, leader of their own party, destroying him as a man, as it was said at the time of the coup in 2016. And they were able to call on uh, the great majority of the Labour Party staffs up and down the country. Uh, I was a Labour Party organiser. I know what kind of people are professionals in the Labour Party staffs in the 1970s and 80s. And I don't think they have changed in terms of their political spots. But it was the uh, dog that was wagging the tail, not the tail that was wagging the dog. Tony Blair is the commander in chief uh, of the uh, counter Corbyn forces. He was determined to break the back of Corbyn and Corbynism and he has succeeded. And I just say this to those watching who haven't yet made up their minds. Staying in a party in which for the, I was going to say foreseeable future, but truthfully, and I know about it, I was in the Labour Party for 36 years. 
to stay in the Labour Party and spend what will be the rest of your life in internal, factional, intra-party struggles is a complete waste of your time and talents. And it will not even succeed because the timbers of the Labour Party are rotten uh, to the core. The corruption in the Labour Party is total. And that was seen in the event which has caused such a hemorrhage of members out of the Labour Party, such a flow of members into the Workers' Party of Britain, namely the overwhelming election of a block of wood uh, whose only claim to anything like uh, leadership credentials is that he kind of half looks like Tony Blair, but without the laughs, without the charisma. Think of Tony Blair without any redeeming feature and you've got Sir Keir Starmer. And when people say to me, as they do, no, I'm staying in to fight, that's first of all, uh, entering into a period of attrition which will do your health and your psychology uh, no good at all, but is a forlorn hope in any case. The Corbyn candidate got 27% of the vote for leader. Even a man like Richard Bergen, a much better egg altogether, uh, got humiliated uh, into, I think, uh, third place uh, with a risible vote uh, below 20%. So I hope that people will conclude uh, that a far more constructive way of spending your political time and talents is actually building a party that is determined to work for socialism in this country and indeed beyond this country, to enter a party where there are no factions, there's no faction fighting. You don't have to fight your leaders. Your leaders are not going to cheat you. Uh, the uh, cadre, we don't even have a paid cadre yet, uh, but we have a voluntary cadre which does exceptional work. And they're not trying to cheat you. They're not taking your money for one purpose, but actually doing something entirely different. So please uh, think about joining us uh, in the Workers' Party of Britain. It'll be good for your health, uh, I promise you, good for your psychological health, and it will be a much more productive thing to do. Now, on to the subject of the meeting, and I hope you forgive me that uh, slight digression, um, but I don't get to speak to you more than uh, once a week, and I thought I should uh, I should say that uh, clearly. Socialism and war. Well, it follows that we believe that capitalism and its highest stage, imperialism, ineluctably leads to war. Uh, the drive to conquer new markets, the drive to take captive uh, new sources of uh, basic commodities and raw materials, for the purposes of, uh, uh, of capitalist uh, exploitation by the, by the global corporations and so on. Uh, this is uh, ineluctably a war like uh, a war waiting to happen, you might say. Uh, and uh, we are uh, going to talk later about one of the theaters in which war is not likely, but if there is to be a war in the near future, I think we can all now safely predict against whom uh, that will be. Uh, but I wanted to begin by saying, and some of you may not agree with this, I appreciate there are uh, some uh, religions uh, that, uh, that uh, preclude, forbid uh, war uh, because uh, they are pacifists, but we are not pacifists. I have never been a pacifist. I have always believed uh, in the concept of just war, uh, that there are uh, circumstances which may arise in which war is the only answer. Uh, and indeed, there have been times when if I'd been alive, I would have been pushing for war earlier than it occurred in 1936, for example, in Spain. Uh, if we had been there, 
uh, I would have been one of those pushing uh, for uh, all out war to defeat fascism in Spain and to stop Hitler and Mussolini in their tracks. And if we had done so in 1936, we may not have had to fight these foes uh, when they were even more formidable in 1939. Obviously, if we'd been around at the time of the First World War, we would have opposed it root and branch. Uh, we would have been prepared to go to prison for so doing so, maybe even worse than that, because the First World War was nothing more or less uh, than an imperialist war, a war which uh, pitted uh, the then empires scrambling for Africa, scrambling for colonies, scrambling for more profit in the uh, emerging uh, uh, capitalist uh, confrontation uh, that started uh, around the end of the 19th century uh, with the unification of Germany and its growth and so on. So uh, the First World War would have been beyond the pale for us and we would have been with John McLean, the great Clyde side revolutionary uh, who uh, did go to prison for his opposition to the war and we would have stood there as he did uh, not as the accused, but as the accuser of capitalism dripping in blood. And I think everyone uh, probably agrees with me when I say that the First World War was the greatest crime. And there have been many. The greatest crime ever committed uh, by, the, uh, by the ruling class of this country against its own people. Uh, the mass slaughter of our young people in that imperialist conflict fought between three grandsons of the British Queen Victoria, who could have settled their differences around the uh, Christmas dinner table at Sandringham, but instead sent millions into the maw, into the slaughter, the blood and the gore. Uh, Britain, in a way, never really recovered uh, from that crime. Uh, the cutting down of the flowers uh, of our youth in the First World War slaughter. Some of you have seen the recent uh, film, uh, was it 1917, I think, uh, which uh, quite well conveyed uh, the madness, the insanity of that conflict. But when it came to the, uh, the overthrow of the Spanish Republic, or the war to overthrow the Spanish Republic, we would have been uh, on the trains uh, to Spain as an international brigade. I happen to believe that the international brigade actually represent the, the apogee uh, of the British labor movement. It is the finest hour of the British labor movement. The uh, contribution that we made, uh, mainly from communists, but also from labor party people, Jack Jones, uh, 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 Clement Attlee, uh, and others. Uh, the contribution which we made to that struggle uh, was not small and was, uh, of course, the cause of great uh, sacrifice. Uh, one of my personal heroes is a young man called John Conford, who was a glittering uh, uh, Oxford, Cambridge University intellectual uh, who died on the Ebro uh, on his 18th birthday. He had gone to Cambridge young and early. Uh, he was the grandson, by the way, of Charles Darwin. He was uh, uh, a Renaissance man, a, a simply wondrous individual, remembered decades, decades later in memoirs uh, of the period, Michael Foote's memoirs, Dennis Healy's memoirs. John Conford was, uh, when I was a teenager, a great hero of mine. And I would have been agitating here in Britain that the time to fight Hitler and Mussolini was then, because they were clearly uh, the steel uh, behind the uh, coup launched uh, by the dictator Franco, who became the dictator Franco. And if we had uh, fought for the Spanish Republic, uh, then we might have stopped fascism in its tracks. But we didn't. 
And therefore we come to the Second World War. And as regular listeners and viewers know, uh, if I had been alive, I would have been uh, first in the queue to join the armed forces in 1939, because the defeat of Hitlerism, fascism, uh, was uh, an existential question. Uh, nothing would have remained uh, under the jackboot of fascism if it had made it here. I've just written a novel, I'm writing its sequel right now uh, uh, on this uh, very subject. And I am one of those who believes uh, that if Churchill had not come to office when he did, uh, that Britain would have capitulated to Hitler, signed a surrender peace, and fascism would have come uh, in one form or another, probably through uh, Mosley and the black shirts of the British Union of fascists, would have come to power in Britain. I cannot find words which are rich enough to celebrate the enormous, decisive, overwhelming contribution of the Soviet Red Army to the victory in the Second World War. It, it is almost indescribable the level of sacrifice, uh, the, the depth of the courage and resistance that was shown, the partisans behind the fascist lines, the defense of Leningrad, the defense of Moscow, perhaps above all the defense of Stalingrad, the turning of the tables on the Nazis, the crushing of the Nazi tank forces at Kursk, and the victorious march of the Red Army right up to the Reichstag and the planting of the Soviet banner uh, on the Reichstag uh, on the 1st of May 1945 is a glorious, glorious achievement. And we celebrate it as a party. It's one of the reasons I say in parenthesis, I should have clarified something I said last week, which has caused a bit of fluttering in the nest. It, uh, I said last week, if you're a Trotskyite, you probably don't want to join the uh, Workers' Party. I was rightly corrected a little bit by our deputy leader, my comrade Jyoti, uh, who, who made the point that, well, if someone found themselves in a Trotsky organization and saw the error of their ways, we wouldn't turn our faces uh, against them necessarily. And I think that's right, uh, although we would need some uh, persuading. But one of the reasons why a Trotskyite would not be welcome uh, in the, would not feel welcome in the Workers' Party is that we celebrate the achievements of the Soviet Union and its Red Army. Indeed, if not for that Red Army, we wouldn't be meeting here this evening. Be sure about that. If not for the Soviet Union, fascism would have prevailed, might even yet still prevail. And I'd be speaking to you in German, but unless I was saying something very different, I'd be shot. And so would most, if not all, of you. Uh, so you're welcome, <laughs> Mr. Trotsky, but you have to accept uh, our analysis uh, of these events and these uh, forces, because you will not persuade us uh, otherwise. Uh, but of course, there have been uh, many wars since the victory in the Second World War, uh, which fit neatly into the paradigm I outlined at the beginning, that war is an ineluctable part of imperialism. And imperialism is the highest stage of capitalism. It's not a, an optional extra. Once capital accumulates in sufficient uh, quantity, uh, then it seeks new markets, new uh, empire uh, that it can exploit and so on. If you look at some of these countries in Africa, for example, I was looking at some today that are producing these rare earth materials. Uh, these uh, materials are so valuable to capitalism that capitalism cannot, cannot possibly contemplate allowing these countries to have independent sovereign governments. So imperialism takes over 
these territories by bribery and corruption, and if necessary, by force. If a, if, if a liberation struggle arose uh, that threatened uh, their hegemony over these sources of vital raw materials for them, uh, they would, of course, invade and occupy and crush that uh, liberation struggle. So we support the wars of the national liberation movements, and we hail uh, the contribution uh, to those wars. I'm trying to make the point that we're not against all wars. We're not pacifists. We would defend our country and our people. Indeed, one of our complaints is that our armed forces and our people are kept entirely separate, just in case one should uh, infect the other with ideas, uh, political uh, ideas. Uh, we, we, we would make many changes if we could uh, to our, the structures of our armed forces, but we would believe in them. We believe we need them and that they need to be properly funded and properly armed and equipped and so on. But we support the national liberation struggles of the people of Vietnam, for example, and the contribution of that China and the Soviet Union made uh, to the victory of that struggle. We supported uh, the national liberation wars in Angola and Mozambique, in Guinea-Bissau, Cape Verde, uh, against fascism, against imperialism. We supported the armed forces of the African National Congress in their alliance uh, with the MPLA in Angola, which didn't just defeat uh, the fascist forces in Angola, but brought down apartheid itself, as conceded by Mandela in public many, many times, but nowhere more spectacularly than on Revolution Square uh, in Havana, underneath that great symbol of Che Guevara, who made war, of course. He made war against dictatorship, not just in uh, Cuba, in the victorious liberation war there. He made war in the Congo, uh, alongside Patrice Lumumba's forces against fascism uh, in the Congo. He even went to Vietnam. So if you're a pacifist, you might not like this, but we cannot be persuaded out uh, of uh, the stance that we take uh, on these matters. Now, war remains a real and present danger. In parenthesis, I make this point to those who say we've got peace in Europe, that the European Union provided uh, however many decades of peace in Europe. No, it didn't. Actually, Europe and NATO which are two cheeks of the same arse, devastated Yugoslavia and deliberately broke it into pieces for imperialist uh, purposes. There was no peace in Europe when Yugoslavia was running uh, with blood and its, uh, its sovereignty uh, invaded and, and violated. But even that's not where it finishes. As I think I mentioned to you last week, although it may have been on the moats, the European Union countries are currently busily stealing from each other vital medical equipment, PPE ventilators, uh, testing equipment, literally parcels that are stamped for the health ministry in Italy are stolen by the Netherlands, uh, parcels that are addressed to the health ministry in France are stolen by one or other uh, European countries. So don't imagine that imperialist rivalry between the European Union powers is no longer possible. But it is obvious that the greatest threat to peace today is the rising tide of deliberately engendered propaganda against the People's Republic of China. This is uh, a real existential question for imperialism. Think about it. China is the most successful non-capitalist, at least non-fully capitalist, definitely non-imperialist country on the earth. 
it has beaten the coronavirus in record quick time with I think 3,700 deaths. We've, we've got out of a population of 66 million, 11,000 deaths plus the 50% that they didn't count. So 17,000 deaths we've got. China had 3,000 deaths. China has, is back at work whilst we haven't even reached the peak of our pandemic and the economic costs that will be associated with it. Economists are predicting a 35% fall in British GDP if the lockdown lasts for three months, which it may very well do. The crisis in the United States has already led, already, and it's by no means over. If Trump drums everybody back out to work, as he may well do in LA, May or even sooner, and then a new wave of infection will cut American people down like flies. And the Great Depression in the United States saw a level of unemployment of 25%. They're going to be at 25% unemployment in the next fortnight in the United States. The same level that they experienced in the Great Depression of the 1930s with Hooverville and tent cities and soup kitchens and the Dust Bowl and all the devastation uh, most memorably written about by John Steinbeck and photographed by some of the greatest American photographers. Uh, that's where the United States is headed. China, on the other hand, is headed upwards. China's economy is already back on track and will only get stronger. China is already the greatest manufacturing power in the world and will only get stronger. China's rise and rise cannot be checked by ordinary capitalist means. China will not allow its economy to be taken over uh, by Western imperialism, taken over or bought over or taken from them by any other means. The days when China took orders from uh, foreign countries is long gone. And so what to do about China? Well, MI5 and MI6, we're watching this tonight, I know, uh, MI5 and MI6 have already told us in the newspapers this very week, at the weekend, uh, that they are going to shift their focus to what they believe will be a newly assertive China after the coronavirus pandemic is finally defeated, which as I said on Moats, it's good news for me being a Russian asset, presumably they're going to start leaving me alone and turn on those that they think are Chinese assets. You know who I mean. So the, uh, the intelligence services have shown us a glimpse of the iceberg. There's going to be more propaganda against China. There's going to be more action taken against China. For example, cutting down the number of Chinese students, believe it or not, who can come and pay top dollar to come uh, to our universities restrictions on what Chinese students can study at our universities. I'm not making this up. This is them talking, the security services briefing the newspapers uh, at the weekend. China will be cut out uh, of certain markets. Japan has just given its companies $2 billion and told them to leave uh, China. And uh, many such sanctions, many of which are already in place, in the great trade war between Donald Trump and China uh, will become intensified. And restrictions on the uh, intellectual property uh, that China is able to get its hands on and so on are all a part of an attempt to get imperialism on a powerful enough footing uh, that it can either order China what to do and subjugate it or if necessary, uh, fight it. You may think that is unnecessarily alarmist, uh, that it is 
uh, uh, that it is a conspiracy theory. But mark my words, the later part of 2020 and into 21, we'll see a steady intensification of measures against China. And our stance on that is very clear. If imperialism attacks China, we are with China. We will stand with China. So MI5 and MI6 better know that. China has friends all over the world and we will not sit silently while imperialism seeks to wound, to damage, to diminish uh, China. If, if uh, the imperialists think that they can win a war with China, uh, then they will unleash one. They're all, you might think, as I say, that that's overly dramatic. Well, tell that to Russia, which is currently encircled by NATO in complete abrogation of the promises made to the fool Gorbachev by Ronald Reagan, the, the, the blind leading the blind, that NATO would not advance on the Russian borders if the Soviet Union withdrew from the eastern part of Germany and brought down the Berlin Wall and so on. All of these promises have been broken. If not for the coronavirus, there'd be a massive war game going on right now on uh, Russia's borders. The provocations uh, of imperialism in the Ukraine, uh, the provocations of imperialism in Georgia, and, uh, uh, and South Ossetia and so on. These are all acts of war. And of course, sanctions and embargoes and so on are equally acts of war. It may be, let's pray, uh, that these acts of war never become hot war in the sense that we knew in decades uh, gone by. But don't rule it out. And I suppose what I'm saying in conclusion is we, we are not neutral. There's, we Look, we love our country. And it's precisely because we love our country, we will not be silent when our country, men and women, are used and abused by imperialism, not to defend our country, but to attack other countries. That's the kind of patriotism which is the last refuge of the scoundrel. As I used to say during the Iraq war, on which I finish now, uh, if not us, who will stand against British imperialism and its involvement in the slaughter uh, in the uh, Gulf? Who if not us and when if not now? Now I played, uh, I think, a leading role. I wasn't the leader, we had no leader, uh, but I played a leading role greater than any other Labour member of Parliament, that's for sure, as anyone who attended the rallies and the demonstrations and the meetings, heard the speeches in Parliament and the interviews on the television and so on knows I played a leading role in the opposition to the Iraq war. Not because uh, as was regularly said at the time, uh, I was a friend of Saddam Hussein or a friend of the Iraqi regime. I was neither of these two things. I, I had never visited Iraq before 1993 and would have been arrested if I had visited because of my personal history with uh, with. Uh, communists in exile from Iraq and so on. Not because I was a friend of Saddam, I wasn't. Not because I was a friend of the Iraqi regime, I, I wasn't. I was not with Saddam, I was against his enemies because I knew his enemies were worse than him and that his enemies' intentions were entirely ignoble, exploitative. They cared nothing for the people of Iraq still less any idea uh, of democracy in Iraq. How could we when our best friend next door is Saudi Arabia, who just 
beheaded their 800th person this morning uh, in the reign of the current king, which has not been a long reign. 800 beheadings, more than ISIS almost. So I opposed that war not because I was a pacifist. Many who did oppose it were pacifists. Quakers, for example, although I kind of went off Quakers when I tried to book the Friends Meeting House for a meeting uh, on British-Russian relations in the wake of the Scripple affair, and they refused me the booking, though some of my finest hours had been spent on the stage in their hall. Uh, but there are no doubt good Quakers, and I appreciate that their reason for opposing the Iraq war was different to mine and to most, if not all, of yours. We oppose imperialism, root and branch, in all its works. If you cut me open, you would find the word anti-imperialist carved into my being, as someone of Irish extraction brought up on the knee of an Irish Republican Roman Catholic communist grandfather, uh, I could be no other. We will fight imperialism in the Workers' Party. We will organize people against it, not just out of solidarity with its victims abroad, but because we know uh, that no nation which oppresses another nation can itself be free, as Karl Marx said. We know that the opportunity cost of weapons and war, our welfare and health services, and decent conditions for workers here in Britain, and not least, we know that the people who will be sent to fight the wars will not be the people who decided on them, will not be the people who would benefit most from them. It would be the workers who would be the number one victims in that war on both sides. Thanks very much for listening. Sorry if I've gone on too long. I do have that habit, but I hope there's time for questions. Wonderful. Thank you, George. I think that was a fantastic speech. And I could see uh, some applause on camera there as well. Um, so, yeah, we've got a, a lot of uh, fantastic questions tonight. So I'll start with uh, a couple uh, off camera. Um, one from Gerard, uh, what is our position on Irish reunification? And uh, then one from Stephen, uh, will, we run from will we run for London Mayor? A little bit off topic of the subject of war, but uh, worth asking. Uh, well, we absolutely, unreservedly, and in principle, out of principle, support the reunification of the 32 counties of Ireland. We march in the tradition of James Connolly and his citizens army. It's Easter time and we remember uh, the heroism of the rising on Easter Sunday of 1916 and the struggle of the Irish people to be free of imperialist uh, domination for 700 years uh, prior to that. And all of Ireland is not yet free. Uh, I used to love the song Four Green Fields uh, one of Ireland's fields is still in bondage and until it is free it is incumbent upon all socialists to support Irish reunification. Uh, I for a very long time long before it was safe to do so still less slightly glamorous to do so was a supporter of Sinn Féin and I remain uh, so uh, although I have uh, many differences now with Sinn Féin on attitudes to the European Union, uh, on uh, attitudes to certain economic matters. Uh, but I do believe that Sinn Féin are the party to achieve uh, reunification uh, on the island of Ireland. Uh, as to the running for uh, London Mayor, uh, I haven't put that formally to my comrades in the leadership of the Workers' Party yet. Uh, but I am seriously considering uh, running for London Mayor. I did run for it last time. I got 154,000 votes. 
And I think that's not a small uh, achievement, given that our campaign team then fitted into my kitchen. It was a, a decently sized kitchen then, uh, but it was still just a kitchen. And the entirety of my uh, campaign team fitted into that kitchen. Some of the people watching now may have been around that kitchen table. Uh, I think we'd have uh, a better go at it this time. Uh, we'd do better than 154,000 votes for two reasons. Uh, one, uh, the failed experiment of uh, Sadiq Khan. What do I mean by failed experiment? Some people find it offensive when I say that. Sadiq Khan was chosen by the Labour Party for no other reason than the colour of his skin, his ethnicity and his religion. He was an experiment in identity politics. He had no experience, precious little ability. He's the world's worst speaker. Trust me, if you want to get to sleep, play a Sadiq Khan speech. It'll have you nodding off in no time. He's never written anything. He's never read anything. He cannot speak. He has no ideas. And the uh, bland blamange of policies that he advanced last time have all utterly and completely failed. One broken promise after another. So there will not be so many takers uh, for Sadiq Khan uh, this time uh, as there was last time. He got overwhelming support from uh, London's Muslim community. A more fool them because they now know four years later just what kind of a man Sadiq Khan really is if they didn't know it at the time. He got the support of London bus workers. Imagine I who joined the Transport Workers Union on Christmas Eve of 1973 was rejected by the uh, my own union, Unite, in favour of a jumped up uh, inky fingered solicitor uh, called Sadiq Khan. But there'll not be many bus workers voting for Sadiq Khan next time. Not least because 21 of them are now dead as a result of his utter failure to protect London transport workers from the consequences of him continuing to run buses and run tubes into which pack people like sardines and the poor driver and other members of staff are going down like flies with coronavirus. And Sadiq Khan says today, he's heartbroken, heartbroken. You're in charge. How could you be heartbroken? It's in your power to do something about it. And I laid out last night overnight uh, the kind of things that need uh, done. Uh, so. I, I may well try to persuade my comrades uh, of the value of a high profile challenge by me for us, for the London Assembly and the London Mayor. And uh, many of the members of the leadership are, of course, watching this now. And uh, so I, I, give them, I give them this fraternal notice that it's something I might well be bringing up soon. Thanks, George. And we'll take uh, another couple of questions now. Uh, one from Chris Murphy. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Welcome, Chris. Oh, hiya, George. You're a little bit quiet, Chris. You might need to speak up. Yeah. Can you hear me? I'm not hearing that, Dan. Oh, very, very quiet, Chris, unfortunately. Um, if you uh, want to type your message in the chat, uh, we can come back to that, I'm afraid. Yeah, we just can't hear you, unfortunately. Uh, and then one from uh, Ian Walker. Go ahead, Ian. Hi, George. Hi, Ian. Everybody. You all right? Yes, um, good, thanks. Just a quick question. Uh, a couple of years ago, I spoke to uh, an ex-Navy uh, soldier who told me that uh, prior to the Falklands War, uh, Margaret Thatcher cut the Navy, naval vessels that were constantly sailing around the Falklands in protection, obviously. Um, do you think that that was a deliberate act by Thatcher to create that war to ensure that she got elected in the following um, election the following year? If I'm being truthful with you, Ian, I, I don't. Um, because I spent a long time, nearly 30 years in the 
corridors of power, uh, I, I kind of came to the conclusion that most things that happen are cock-ups rather than conspiracies. I think our leaders are not James Bonds, but more Austin Powers or Johnny English. Uh, I, I think that it was a, a, a penny wise, pound foolish decision probably, but I may be wrong uh, about that. Uh, one thing is for sure uh, that she withdrew the very scant uh, naval cover for the British colony, uh, for that's what it is, of the Falkland Islands, uh, many thousands of miles from home, with 2,300 people, more sheep uh, on the islands than people. Uh, and she was ready to leave the guts of brave soldiers on the, on the goose green. Uh, she was ready to sacrifice many brave sailors uh, for uh, the imperial purpose. Uh, of retaining control uh, over the Falkland Islands. Uh, the idea that uh, the Falkland Islands belong to us is a Ruritarian fantasy, a Gilbert and Sullivan plot. And from the point of view of the Workers' Party, we completely uh, eschew the idea of any British colonies abroad. Thanks, George. Uh, then we have uh, a couple of written questions here. Uh, one from Wayne. What is the motivation for being anti-China? Uh, are we not linked together when it comes to trade? So I think he's referring to, to the British state and media being anti-China, not us ourselves. And uh, what is our attitude to anti-war organisations uh, such as Stop the War Coalition? What do we think of those? Uh, the, the first part of the question is, uh, is correct. Uh, that there are, there's more than one current in Britain. Uh, David Cameron and George Osborne uh, were very much in the pro-China current. Uh, they thought that British capitalism and them personally uh, could benefit massively from a closer relationship between Britain and China. And we have recently, over the Huawei affair, uh, seen a division uh, within uh, right-wing circles, capitalism, imperialism, uh, on the best way forward uh, with China. Uh, there's uh, more than one point of view. You're quite correct. But it's my estimation, reading the runes, listening carefully to what's being said, uh, that the balance has now been shifted and that the security service briefing uh, over the weekend indicates that a new course of action has been uh, decided upon. And that new course of action is to, uh, if I may put it in the rather rude words of a former British ambassador to Washington, who was ordered by Tony Blair to uh, go to Washington, get in the president's arse and stay there. Uh, I think that that is the new policy of the British government to cling as uh, closely as possible uh, to Donald Trump. And that means going uh, further and deeper into confrontation uh, with China. I was a founder member of the Stop the War Coalition. I was uh, for many years uh, its vice president uh, for reasons which I'm, I'm not entirely clear about. Uh, I have been uh, completely removed uh, from, and uh, I can date it uh, to the uh, issue of uh, Julian Assange and the, and the fake imperialist rape allegations that he faced. Uh, that was, I think, the moment, though no one ever wrote to me, no one ever called me. I just stopped being invited to their platforms. And I have not spoken on a Stop the War platform since Ed Miliband was the leader of the Labour Party uh, at the time of British, the British bombing of Syria. I made rather a good speech, considering it was my last one uh, outside Parliament uh, that night. 
uh, but I've never heard a word uh, from the Stop the War Coalition since. Uh, notwithstanding that, because I'm not a petty person like them, uh, I would uh, urge support for any and all legitimate anti-war activities. And I think the Workers' Party will be doing uh, some of those ourselves. Uh, but of course, we are ready to march with others whilst retaining our own positions and march together uh, ourselves within wider bodies. And if uh, the Stop the War Coalition ever gets back on the street again in any numbers, uh, then uh, we'll also be on the same streets at the same time. But of course, we have our own leaders. We don't need the leaders of the Stop the War Coalition. Fantastic. And then we have uh, a question from uh, Samuel McKenzie. Go ahead, Samuel. Are you there, Sam? Um, I'm afraid we can't hear you, so um, I will just uh, read out his question. Uh, he wanted to ask um, how we can build people over profits initiatives that could help bring people out of hardship uh, during these times. Um, I've seen that uh, Chris Williamson and some others have proposals for the labour movement uh, to provide soup kitchens and food banks for workers. It doesn't grab me that as the best use of our uh, time and effort it's a bit it's a bit charity uh, i think our best uh, position is to organize people to demand of the state uh, the services that they need not to try and replace the state uh, that would be a matter more uh, relevant in in a revolutionary situation and we are not in a revolutionary situation in this country at this point in time uh, i think uh, for example uh, we ought to be uh, raising this question i don't say this easily I'm not even sure if i've ever said it before but i am asking myself where are the unions in this great national debate that's going on around the coronavirus uh, it may be that they're issuing press releases that no one is uh, picking up, but have they ever heard of Twitter? Uh, I, I actually am uh, completely in the dark about any serious demands that are being made by trade unions for the uh, protection of their workers, with the exception of the, of the London buses and the RMT on the tube. Uh, but I'm not hearing a big push, and I expected to. This is the time. Think of the concessions that the unions could win right at this point in time. If Len McCloskey said, there aren't going to be any buses unless you've put a mask on every bus driver. There aren't going to be any buses unless you've taped off and, and sealed the front door and sealed the front area and put up a plastic screen and abandon the idea of the driver collecting fares. I'll tell you, if, if Len McCluskey did that, uh, the employer would have to immediately capitulate. This is a, quite a good time to be a trade union leader with the employer's capitalism uh, on the ropes. Uh, so I'd rather, I think, spend our time agitating uh, for unions and for the state uh, to do what they're being paid for in the first case and in the second case have the duty and responsibility to do others may disagree with me on that but I, i've always felt that socialist activists becoming you know charity collectors or organizers of food banks and so on was not right Thank you, George. Uh, we'll try taking a couple of questions now. One from Alec Lee. Go ahead, Alec. Hi, George. How you doing, mate? Good, Alec. Thank you. Yeah, uh, lovely to speak to you again. Um, my question is about um, funding for the military industrial complex um, in the wake of the coronavirus. I mean, we remember that just before 
uh, all of this broke out. Uh, Trump announced triumphantly that there were three trillion uh, dollars worth of equipment that was uh, potentially heading its way towards Iran and things like that. Uh, do we think that um, that the funding will be cut as uh, this is something we can't afford anymore, or will this just uh, rumble on in the background with its activities to do with, uh, you know, most obviously Iran, Venezuela, countries like this, um, and will it just carry on as normal? Well, uh, military spending uh, has been described accurately as as welfare for for uh, capitalism, and that's exactly what it is. Uh, vastly disproportionate sums of money are spent on weapons, uh, many of which oftentimes don't work. The new American fighter, was it, the F-35, something like that, uh, has, uh, has been a, a multi-billion dollar washout. Uh, we ourselves uh, have half of our Navy in dry dock at any one time with all kinds of technical uh, problems. Uh, and the, uh, the situation with the Trident uh, system would be our main point of contention. Uh, we consider uh, that British possession uh, of American owned and controlled uh, nuclear weapons on our submarines, which cannot even be used, even if it was sane in any circumstances to use them, cannot be used by us without the Americans agreeing and dual keying uh, the launching of these weapons. This is a grotesque, gargantuan waste of money. And it's one of the reasons why uh, the poor bloody infantry in the uh, arm, army, in the Navy and in the Air Force are so short of decent housing, decent pay, uh, decent conditions, decent equipment and, and so on. Because a, a, a ridiculous proportion of our defense budget is being spent on nuclear weapons that are useless in any foreseeable circumstances. Uh, the, the main threat to Britain now is a man with a, with a dirty bomb in, his, uh, in the boot of his car, uh, not uh, the launch of intercontinental ballistic missiles from any other country at us. Although, interestingly, I did read a report this week that the United States has an extant military plan to invade and occupy Britain. Uh, and uh, it, it developed it uh, during, uh, during the Cold War when it feared that Britain might uh, join the other camp. Uh, and uh, in which case they were going to invade and occupy us. I'm not making this up. This is not the plot of a new novel. Uh, this is a fact. The US have a plan to occupy us. And I, I'm looking at my wife now, who's from Amsterdam, there is actually an act of Congress, passed by Congress, signed by the president, to invade the Netherlands, should any American official be grabbed and put on trial at The Hague. There's an actual invasion of the Netherlands act, extant on the statute book in the United States. So nobody should think they're a permanent friend of the United States. Please note, Netherlands and Britain. Thanks, George. Uh, then we have a question from Alex Wilmot. Go ahead, Alex. Ah, Alex, welcome. Hi, George. How's it going? Can you hear me? Yes, very, very glad to have you on board, my friend. Hey, fantastic. Uh, well done tonight. Everything you said was was bang on again. Um, I just want to just want to ask a question about um, imperialist wars, which we've seen quite a lot over the last three to four decades. Who are the profiteers of these wars? Um, are we talking about uh, companies? Are we talking about um, deep state sort of mystery things? I'd love to put a nail on it. Could you really put a nail on who are the profiteers of these illegal wars? Well, obviously, the military industrial complex are the most direct and immediate beneficiaries of the endless appetite for war uh, of uh, imperialism. And it's very, very, very good business. I mean, we cannot, as mere mortals, imagine the largesse uh, of, uh, for example, the, the, uh, the Yamama uh, arms deal between Mrs. Thatcher and the Saudi dictatorship was rightly described 
as the biggest sale of anything to anybody at any time in human history. And indeed it was. And so vast uh, a deal was it that hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds were able to be corruptly funneled uh, back to the uh, corrupt princes of Saudi Arabia and who knows who else was on the take for that. Uh, but uh, of course the invasion and destruction of Iraq uh, once the uh, thirst of the uh, of the military industrial complex had been uh, slaked uh, it was the oil companies who then took possession uh, of Iraq's uh, sovereign uh, resources uh, and it was uh, the uh, Bechtel and uh, Halliburton and so on uh, that uh, forcibly took the contracts to rebuild the very country that they had just destroyed. Um, I know it sounds a bit catch-22, but it's nice work if you can get that. You make money from destroying a country, and then you make even more money uh, from rebuilding it. And you don't give them any choice as to who uh, the rebuilders are going to be. Uh, wars like Vietnam were, were more uh, geopolitical, and that's, of course, we're not at the end of that. If there was a war for Ukraine, for example, it would not, in the narrow sense, be so that anyone could profit from Ukraine. There would be individual uh, corruption, of course, the Bidens and so on are case in point of that. But the Ukraine's actually not a source of profit for the imperialist powers, on the contrary. Uh, if they strap Ukraine to their back, uh, they'll buckle at the knees uh, because Ukraine will require a lot more from them than they'll be able to get from, uh, from the Ukraine. It's Ukraine, Vietnam were about ensuring uh, that the socialist camp uh, could, not, uh, could not consolidate itself. Uh, they genuinely believed so did I, I must confess, uh, that the red flags uh, that were sprouting in many places around the world in the 1970s uh, would go on uh, spreading and that the area of exploitation uh, for imperialism would be steadily reduced and that countries like China, like the Soviet Union as was, uh, would become more and more strong. And so they made a stand in Southeast Asia. Uh, they didn't actually, I think, make much out of Vietnam. They're probably making more profit out of Vietnam now uh, than they were uh, then. But they were pouring huge sums of money into the corrupt ruling elite in South Vietnam. Uh, at the at the time, so sometimes, as we say, the enemy lifts off a, a huge stone, only to drop it on its own feet. A good case in point of that recently would be Libya. If it was their intention, one presumes it was, uh, that they could make a lot of money out of Libya by destroying the power that was there and parachuting in their exiles into power in their place, if that was their intention, that too has turned out to be a huge boomerang. And nobody makes any money out of Libya because Libya, uh, its oil production is on the floor. Uh, that which is produced can oftentimes not even be shipped. Oil prices fell again by $6 uh, today. They're at uh, near historic lows. Uh, so nobody actually gained out of destroying uh, Libya and, uh, and killing its people uh, and uh, turning upside down uh, the relatively successful uh, system and economy that they had there. Nobody made any money out of it. This is why uh, my point earlier, we're really not run by James Bond. It's definitely more Johnny English. Thanks, George. Um, we've got a question from Helen Sutcliffe up next. Helen, go ahead. Yes. Um, my question is about Palestine, uh, slightly off topic. Um, 
yeah what how will the um coronavirus have affected the people in gaza um given that the un united nations have have um, already told us that uh, conditions are unlivable in in gaza um with 90 odd percent of the water deemed un undrinkable and um uh, you know it being the most densely populated place on earth um and how how as a party george will we be um will we be openly and actively supporting um palestine uh, and standing well, thanks, uh, thanks for that, Helen. Uh, as you probably know, I have been doing so uh, all of my life since uh, since I was a teenager, and my profile uh, over the last 40, 45 years on this matter has been quite high. Uh, and I think that the uh, prestige uh, of that work uh, will be uh, useful to the Workers' Party, and the Workers' Party needs to take on that mantle uh, as the party which stands up for Palestine when it's illegal to do so in the British Labour Party. Imagine if you were to say uh, that Israel was a racist apartheid state in the Labour Party, you would have to be expelled. And that goes for even those who made a long career out of saying it, uh, like Jeremy Corbyn uh, or John McDonald. Uh, they have presided over uh, the institution of IHRA principles, uh, which make it an expellable offence to say the things that they routinely said uh, throughout all of their political lives. I'm not sure how, now that they're out, uh, they will be able to explain that. And the fat law of good it did, not only was it completely immoral, uh, it was a complete failure. It didn't, uh, it didn't uh, palliate in any way the onslaught against them by the supporters of Israel. So a policy which is immoral and a failure uh, cannot be a policy uh, that anyone can be proud of. And uh, although that will now be uh, redoubled, tightened uh, in the Labour Party, anybody who is interested in Palestine will not be able to campaign for Palestine inside the Labour Party, but they will be uh, inside uh, the Workers' Party. Uh, we will not fixate on it, I should tell you. Uh, it is one struggle, a very noble one and a very long lasting one and one that Britain is inextricably linked to. Our main work will be on Britain. And this is a change for me, one that I'm actually looking forward to. Our task in this period as a new party seeking to establish ourselves is to talk to the British workers about the things that most vitally concern them and most immediately, uh, most directly uh, concern them. Of course, we'll have a foreign policy and of course, Palestine will be a significant part uh, of it. Uh, and uh, we shouldn't overestimate also what our impact or influence uh, can be on this. We have no members of parliament. We have as yet no councillors, I think. Uh, but the days will come when we do have these things and when we will be in a better position with a bigger platform uh, to talk about them. Thank you, George. And uh, yeah, we've had uh, a lot of good questions coming in tonight and they keep coming. So we're going to try and uh, get through everyone that's asked. Uh, but please don't be offended if we have to finish before we can come round to you. So, uh, Tom. Uh, Tom Curtin, you had a, a question for us. Hi. Um, yeah, basically, my question is regarding the Five Eyes Alliance. I can't hear Tom, uh, but Daniel, if you can hear, you can convey it to me. 
Uh, Sorry, yeah, I can. I can way. just about hear. Go ahead, uh, Tom, and I can uh, repeat it. Yeah, I do apologise. Um, my question is regarding the Five Eyes Alliance and how obviously Britain is a key part and player of that alliance, and how our intelligence services um, propagate fake news, propaganda, and um, general imperialist thought across the global south, but more precisely in uh, existing communist nations through um, certain psyop-based programs like Radio Free Asia and other, um, you know, CIA-backed uh, kind of operations like this. And when we have more power in the country, how do we steer Britain away from the Five Eye program or how do we end it altogether, ideally? <laughs> Well, uh, thanks, Tom. The, the Five Eyes is, uh, is uh, the Imperialist uh, Brains Trust. Uh, it follows that uh, we, all, we oppose it. Um, Britain doesn't have the steel that it once had, uh, but it's still got brains. Um, we, our aircraft carriers might not have any aircraft, but our 77th Brigade uh, are uh, pretty good at uh, disruptive disinformation, uh, operations uh, online. This is a point I'd like to make actually to the members uh, that you, we, we should be trying to tune ourselves uh, to what are clearly troll and possibly intelligence community uh, troll uh, efforts at destabilization and creation of division and, uh, and so on. Uh, Craig Murray has written uh, a good piece on how to recognize a uh, troll. I recommend it uh, to you. Uh, the the uh, 77th Brigade, which is the keyboard warriors, part of the British Army, imagine, uh, their purpose is to, uh, they say, uh, battle disinformation, but in fact, uh, that's an Orwellian uh, piece of doublespeak. Uh, their purpose is to propagate disinformation. You're right, Tom, largely in the Global South, and against uh, Britain's uh, declared enemies or perceived enemies. Uh, but we discovered through the so-called Integrity Initiative, uh, which has had to rebrand, rename itself, because of the enormous strategic damage that we did to them by exposing them and, and raining down our fire on them. Uh, we saw in the Integrity Initiative that a British government money was even being used uh, to discredit the leader of Her Majesty's opposition, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, imagine. So money uh, voted by Parliament uh, for government expenditure was being used to slander and smear uh, the leader of the opposition in that Parliament. So if they're prepared to do that to Jeremy Corbyn, uh, just imagine what they'd like to do to us. Uh, so be on your guard uh, for that. But the Five Eyes, I mean, it's quite embarrassing, actually. Uh, although there is a sixth eye, but it's never spoken uh, directly. But the Five Eyes are the five Anglo-Saxon eyes uh, of, uh, of the white Anglo-Saxon uh, countries. Uh, the sixth is, of course, Israel, uh, which is uh, intimately connected to both the intelligence services in the United States but also in Britain. I'm led to believe that in the MI6 headquarters at Vauxhall Cross, there is an actual section uh, of the Israeli intelligence service there, housed in our uh, intelligence services headquarters. Don't ask me how I know that or I'd have to kill you. Thank you, George. Uh, and next up, we have a question from Kat Sumner. Ah, Tess, welcome. Pat. <laughs> um, hi, George. Um, I just wanted to ask you what your thoughts are about public ownership of the weapons industry um, and things that follow on from that, like defence diversification and um, removal of PFI from the Ministry of Defence. Yes, of course. Uh, we believe in the public ownership of the commanding heights of the economy and the arms industry uh, is uh, a, an important and highly profitable, highly a lucrative, very high-tech uh, industry. So, of course, if we could, we would take it into public ownership. And until we can, we will agitate for its uh, being taken into public ownership. 
we would not stop making weapons. Uh, Britain makes quite good weapons, actually, uh, but we would make weapons for our country's defense and uh, not to attack uh, other countries. So there would be a dramatic shift in our defense expenditure if we were running uh, this country. Uh, we wouldn't need uh, aircraft carriers for a start. We wouldn't need Trident nuclear submarines. Uh, we would have a much bigger Navy uh, as a country with so many thousands of miles of coastline, our uh, 20 uh, ship Navy, 20 surface ship fleet uh, in the Navy uh, is only about half of that. Uh, you might ask me how I know about these things because I used to represent the yard on the Clyde that built the Type 23 frigates. And, uh, and we, we haven't even got half uh, of that minimum number of ships in our Navy. So when you hear about the Royal Navy being scrambled to uh, to uh, to frighten off Russian Russians in the in the English Channel. Believe me, it's not all that frightening. Uh, so we'd have actually a bigger navy than the uh, British uh, have. It goes without saying we'd build all the ships ourselves, and we'd have uh, probably a bigger army, uh, a smaller uh, uh, a smaller uh, expeditionary army, but a bigger defensive uh, army. And we'd make it a people's army. Uh, we would uh, we'd make it an army that was not entire and separate from uh, the uh, the society that it uh, serves. And we would have no qualms, as uh, as uh, Putin has just done uh, in the last hour or two, uh, using the army to, uh, for example, uh, uh, assist with the battle against the coronavirus. Uh, the army should be the people and the people should be the army. Uh, we should be proud of our army and our army should be proud of us. But in fact, uh, hardly anyone has ever any interface uh, with the British army as presently constituted. Thanks, George. Next up, we have a question from Darren Coyle. Go ahead, Darren. Hi, George. Um, I just wanted to know your thoughts on the oil price war with Saudi and Russia and the impact of the lockdown on the war and oil prices. Well, uh, thanks, uh, Darren. Nice to meet you at last. Uh, the, um, the oil price fell again today. Uh, that wasn't the intention of the, uh, the grand design uh, of, uh, of the deal that was reached last week between uh, OPEC and its uh, allies, including Russia. Uh, the, the oil price was supposed to stabilize, but it has fallen. And the reason it's fallen is because worldwide demand for oil uh, is, uh, is really pretty much unprecedentedly low levels. Uh, I'm sure those of you who drive cars have not been filling them up much uh, <laughs> over the last uh, three weeks. I haven't. Uh, I'm not even sure I filled it up once. Uh, I only go out once a week to, to do the mother of all talk shows and the cars sitting at the, uh, on the driveway. And that's true for uh, people all over the world in their uh, scores of millions. So domestic consumption of uh, petroleum oil products is uh, very low. But of course, also the shutdown of industry uh, is such uh, that the uh, demand is... Uh, is uh, pretty much rock bottom. I'm pretty sure that not, not since the pre-industrial times was, uh, was there so little demand for energy in the energy sector. Um, so, and, and we're now moving into the spring and summer when even heating will be uh, less often used. Uh, I think uh, in a planned economy, you would have a planned uh, oil price. Uh, we are ourselves here in Britain still producers, not uh, all that significant and not for all that much longer, but we are still producers. And obviously we want uh, our country to benefit from that. Uh, Russia uh, is a major uh, oil producer and so is Venezuela, the biggest in the world. So we, we want a decent price uh, for oil, uh, but we... Uh, realize that the Saudis have uh, a desperate need for cash right now. 
They are fighting a losing war in the Yemen. Uh, there's a rising discontent amongst their young people, uh, uh, unemployment and underemployment there. So they are privatizing Aramco uh, and they are uh, turning on the taps and flooding the market with oil. Uh, but they saw that that didn't uh, actually achieve very much uh, over the brief period in which they've done it. And they've said that they will now uh, tighten those taps again and try and restrict the uh, flow of oil given the uh, fall in the market. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, George. And we have a, a question coming up from Tess as well. Tess, go ahead. Uh, hi, George uh, and everyone. Um, if there is a war with China, what kind of war will it be? Is it going to be a trade war, nuclear war? What's going to happen? It's unlikely uh, to be a nuclear war because uh, China and its friends are well armed and well able to defend themselves from uh, nuclear war. Uh, it's likely to be a salami type uh, war. It's likely to involve Taiwan. It's likely to try and involve the other countries uh, with uh, uh, claims on the South China Sea. Uh, it's likely to begin as an ever more extreme economic war with sanctions and embargoes and, uh, and so on. I hope that none of this happens. I'm just alerting you to the uh, dangers of it happening. Were it to be a nuclear war, well, we'll all be dead. So, uh, and so will everybody else. Thanks, Tess. Thanks, George, and we'll try coming back to you, Chris, uh, if you're able to try again. See if we can hear you this time. Still very quiet, unfortunately. Okay, I will read your question out. Um, since the election of Sir Keir Starmer, uh, many working class socialists have left Labour. Either they've joined us now or are politically homeless. We support our socialist brothers and sisters in countries across the world and oppose imperialism, such as that in Iraq, which has murdered and displaced millions. And his question is, why should ex-socialist Labour members join us and not parties such as the Socialist Party or Socialist Workers Party? Because both of those other parties are proven failures. Um, they are not identical and they're not the same level of failures. Uh, but the Socialist Workers Party is, I think, more or less defunct and its, uh, its analysis of history uh, has not survived the test of time. Uh, their uh, third campism uh, was very much a uh, 1960s, 1970s uh, zeitgeist. And I think the little local difficulties that they've had, not so little actually, uh, have, uh, have damaged them uh, gravely. Uh, they are a party that recruit people and burn them out very, very quickly. I mean, one of the biggest parties in the country is the party of ex-members of the SWP. Uh, the Socialist Party is a more uh, serious uh, outfit. Uh, it has uh, more in the way of, uh, of a penetration into the trade union ranks and so on. Uh, has quite a decisive uh, say in one or two white collar unions, though not as much as they did, uh, not as much as they did even in the civil service unions, and certainly not in unison, which we now know uh, is, uh, is a Blairite uh, controlled union. Uh, it's a retirement home for, uh, for, uh, for Blairite uh, officials drummed out of the Labour Party. Uh, the, um, the Socialist Party's uh, historical analysis is not as bad as uh, the SWP's, but still very, very bad. Both of them are Trotskyite uh, organizations, and therefore both of them have a very limited appeal. We are not a Trotskyite uh, organization, and I think we have a wider appeal. As I said uh, last week, I'll repeat it, 
most of our members have come from the Labour Party, not from the ultra left. Most of our members uh, 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 have never been on the ultra left or in any of these groupuscules of the uh, of the Trotskyite uh, ultra left. Uh, some of our members came from the Brexit Party, one or two even from UKIP, uh, but many and many also from no party at all. So we are a different uh, kettle of fish. And I think, I don't want to sound immodest in any way, but I've got a higher profile than the leaders of the uh, SWP and of the Socialist Party. I don't think anyone I could dispute that. And I've got a, a, a bigger support. Uh, by the end of this evening, I'll have, I think, 350,000 followers on Twitter. I've got 630,000 followers on Facebook. Uh, I've got 19,000 followers on Instagram and so on. I could go on. I'm trying to make the point that we have a mass reach that none of them have ever had and ever will have. So between my profile and history and your profiles and your histories, I think we have put together an outfit that has a real fighting chance of becoming a, a big and significant organization in Britain. I believe that. Thank you, George. I have to say from the meetings we've had this year, I've never been so inspired and, and so uplifted by some of the people that we've met. And hopefully we'll be back to those um, in-person meetings uh, whenever we can. But in the meantime, uh, we're going to have these uh, online meetings every Tuesday at 8pm. So join us across uh, the Workers Party on Twitter, Facebook and YouTube. And we're now uh, broadcasting it on uh, George's platforms as well. So there's no excuse to miss it. And uh, there's even less excuse to uh, get involved and uh, sign up on workerspartybritain.org. Um, and to all our members, we'll be having another members meeting tomorrow where we'll be able to answer the questions we didn't get around to tonight because uh, we run out of time. And uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you there and look forward to seeing everyone else next week. Last word to you, George. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, comrades and friends, for joining us at this virtual uh, public meeting. I know it's not as good as a real public meeting. I like to be standing rather than sitting. I like to see and hear from the people I'm speaking to uh, much better than this, but it's the best we can do. And it's better, I think, than others are doing. Uh, don't forget the mother of all talk shows on Sundays at 7 p.m. Don't forget Sputnik still orbiting the world. Uh, good uh, edition coming up this week. Uh, it's uh, on Saturdays uh, five times. And if you haven't bought Queensway, my novel yet, 4 99 you've still got a good few weeks in lockdown. You need to be reading. I promise you it's a good read. Thanks very much indeed. <laughs>